in this hopefully brief series of lectures, we are going to discuss what I call the holy trinity of vector calculus, namely the gradient, the divergence, and the curl. In this lecture, I am going to focus on the first of these three, the gradient. And just to give you an idea of what the gradient is, let us first do a warm up in one dimension, where we are talking of functions of a single variable, let's say f of x. And gradient here is essentially a number which tells us how fast does a function f of x change at a particular point, let's say x equals x0. And we all know the answer to that. The change in f df is related to the displacement or change in x dx by df equals the derivative of f at x and evaluated of course at x0 times dx. So this particular number df dx at x0 is the gradient of the function f at the point x. It tells you how fast the function rises as you move along the curve. Let me also remind you that if you were to draw a f of x versus x curve, then at the point x0, df dx at x0 would essentially give you the slope of the tangent, which is also called in colloquial language the gradient of this particular curve. It tells you how steep or how flat the curve is. Now things become slightly more complicated when we go over to three dimensions and we start talking about functions of more than one variable. So we are going to talk about a scalar field here which is a function phi of x, y, z. I am calling this a scalar field because the function phi here or rather the value of the function phi at any given point is going to be a scalar. This scalar is defined if not at all x, y, z, at least at all x, y, z values in a region. So this is a quantity which is defined at every point in a region, hence the term field. So the question that we are asking is, how fast will phi change? When you move from a given point, let's say p, with coordinates x, y, and z, to a neighboring point q, whose coordinates have changed a bit. So their coordinates are now x plus dx, y plus dy, z plus dz. Here we are going to ultimately consider dx, dy, and dz to be infinitesimally small quantities. So these two points, p and q, are really infinitesimally close to each other. But of course, we can't draw infinitesimally close points, so I'm going to show this with a finite distance. Here you have the point P, and here you have the point Q, and the displacement vector which takes you from the point P to the point Q, dr, is this vector whose components are dx, the change in x, dy, the change in y, and dz, the change in z. So dr vector, here yeah, the displacement vector, is dxi plus dyj plus dzk. And obviously, we are talking about the change in phi, that is the value of phi of q minus the value of phi at p. And this is what I am going to call d phi, which is why I have written the phi of q here as phi of p plus d phi. So once again, elementary first year calculus tells us that when you have a function of three variables, then its change, when you change the three variables, is actually a sum of three terms. One which would have told you how much would phi change if you changed x alone. Another would answer the same question, but if you were to change y alone. And yet a third term which would measure the change in phi if you were to change z alone. So t phi The change in phi would be del phi del x evaluated at the point p dx plus del phi del y at the point p dy plus del phi del z at the point p dz. Let me once again remind you that if this had been a function of a single variable, 
df would be df dx at the point x equal to x0, which I am calling the point P for the time being, times dx. So what you have here is a three-dimensional generalization of that. Instead of a ordinary derivative df dx, which we had done here because f is a function of one variable, here phi is a function of x, y, and z, and therefore d phi has three terms, one corresponding to change in x alone, another change in y alone, and a third change in z alone. By the way, this would also work if we were talking of functions of more than three variables. If the function had variables x1, x2, x3 up to xn, then d phi would have been del phi del x1 dx1 plus del phi del x2 dx2 plus all the way up to del phi del xn dxn. But for the time being, we will focus in three dimensions and therefore we are going to talk about functions of only three variables x, y and z. Also note that here the x, y and z variables that we are using is suggestive. We are trying to imply that we are using Cartesian coordinates to talk about points. But this particular form for d5 would hold no matter which coordinate system you were using. If instead of x, y, z you were to use some other coordinate system, let's say with coordinates q1, q2, q3, then function phi would have been a function of q1, q2 and q3 and d phi would have been del phi del q1 dq1 plus del phi del q2 dq2 plus del phi del q3 dq3. For the time being, let us stick to x, y and z being Cartesian coordinates and see what we can get from there. Near the end of this lecture, I am going to talk about other coordinate systems, in particular about spherical polar and cylindrical polar coordinate systems and talk about how the vector field that we are going to find out, the gradient, looks in those coordinate systems. But right now, we have to figure out what it looks like in the Cartesian coordinate system, which is the simplest one to use. So let us now focus on this expression for d5 and try to rewrite this in a slightly different manner. Note that the expression itself is composed of two different kinds of terms. On the one hand, we have del phi del x, del phi del y and del phi del z evaluated in the each case at the point P. On the other, we have these terms dx, dy and dz. Notice that the first class of objects essentially talk about how fast the function phi is changing at the point P respectively as you move along the x-axis, along the y-axis and along the z-axis. On the other hand, dx, dy, dz talks about the displacement from P to Q. Notice that these three terms are local and they refer to the value of the partial derivatives at the point P. So they only talk about the nature of the function at the point P. These three on the other hand talk about the way you go from P to Q. So it would be nice if we could split the expression into two parts. One part which con contains the displacement and terms describing that alone. Another part which describes how the function phi changes with x, y and z. And using the notion of the dot product, this actually is very easy to do. You can actually easily write this expression in the following form. The dot product of two different vectors. This one is simply dx i plus dy j plus dz k and that of course is nothing but the displacement between the points p and q, this dr vector. And in order to get this expression correctly, what we need to do is dot it with this vector. 
a vector whose three components are del phi del x at p, del phi del y at p, and del phi del z at p, respectively. Of course, we are missing a k hat here. It's of course very easy to check that if I take the dot product of this vector with this one, I am going to get d phi as an expression. So this is how you split up differential of phi, the amount by which phi changes when you undergo a displacement through dr into two pieces. The dr vector here dotted with this object, which is a vector of course, and we call this the gradient of phi at p, in analogy with the standard notion that how steep a curve is, is its gradient. Here, the gradient actually tells you how fast the function phi changes as x, y and z change. But it's actually telling you how fast it changes when you are at the point p. We shorten this and write grad phi at p dot dr. As the name suggests, this is the value of the gradient of phi at the point p. So gradient of phi actually is a vector field whose value at a particular point is this particular vector. And it's easy to see what that vector field is. Grad phi, the vector field, is one whose components are given by del phi del x, del phi del y, and del phi del z, respectively. And these are, of course, functions of x, y, and z. So give me a point P with coordinates x, y, and z, I will be able to give you this corresponding vector grad phi at p. So this of course is a vector field, one which defines a vector at all points x, y, z of the region of interest. So the gradient of a scalar field phi is a vector field, grad phi. Now one very important notion connected to this is that of the directional derivative which is nothing but the rate at which the function phi changes when you move away from the point P in the direction of a particular unit vector n hat. And the way we write this is del phi del n hat. This vector in the denominator, so to speak, of this expression is simply a reminder that we are calculating a directional derivative in a direction of n hat. And this is actually how fast phi changes with s at the point p, where ds is the magnitude of the displacement which is incurred when you change coordinates x, y, and z by infinitesimal amounts dx, dy, and dz respectively. So how much this changes is again elementary. It's basically del phi del x dx plus del phi del y dy plus del phi del z dz was the infinitesimal change in phi, the rate at which this changes simply is del phi del x at the point p times dx ds plus del phi del y at the point p times dy ds plus del phi del z at the point p times dz ds. ds is nothing but the magnitude of the vector dr. That is why we are writing dr vector as ds, the length into n hat, the unit vector in the direction in which the displacement is taking a place. And it's very easy to see that this is nothing but a dot product again of gradient of phi at the point P, but this time a dot product with n hat, the unit vector in the direction of dr, which of course has components given by dx ds plus dy ds s j plus dz ds k. So this is the unit normal in the direction of the displacement. Now this formula that we have arrived at for the directional derivative of a function phi, taken in the direction of the unit vector n hat at the point p, that it is given by the dot product of n hat, the unit vector, with the value of gradient of phi at the point p leads us to a very easy way of interpreting what the gradient of scalar function phi really is, at least what its value at a particular point P is. Note that the dot product of two vectors A and B 
is given by the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them. A very familiar formula. Now, if one of these vectors happen to be a unit vector, let's say we are doing A vector dot with N hat, where N hat is a unit vector, then this dot product becomes magnitude of A times cosine of the angle between A and this unit vector N hat. Since the cosine of an angle can take a maximum value of plus 1, which happens when this angle is 0, the nice interpretation that we have for the value which the gradient of a scalar takes at a particular point is that it gives you a vector whose direction gives the direction in which phi increases fastest. That is, the direction in which the directional derivative is the largest. Of course, at this particular point P. And what about its magnitude? Its magnitude actually gives you the largest rate in which phi will increase at a particular point. So the gradient of phi both gives you the direction of steepest ascent, so to speak. If you imagine that this function describes the height of a hill, this will give you the direction in which you can move so that you get to the highest point fastest or at least locally gain height the fastest. And its value definitely gives you the rate at which you gain this height. Now this leads to a rather nice pictorial interpretation, at least for functions of two variables, where you can think of the third function, z, to be function of x and y, and interpret z as a height which a particular point on the surface takes above the plane with coordinates x, y describing points on the plane. Now, from childhood geography, we have learned a trick by which we can talk of these varying heights, which are contour diagrams. And I'm just going to try to explain this issue to you using a set of contour lines. I've just marked off few of the contour lines here. And I'm going to focus on this particular point P. And try to talk about the gradient of this height function at the point P. For that, I'm going to use the neighboring contour lines here, the blue one and the purple one. So you can see that at this point P, if you were to move along this orange vector, you're going to have to move a long distance before you can get to gain a height of 10 meters. Whereas if you move along the red vector, you are going to get there the quickest. That is, this is the direction in which height is increasing the fastest. Hence, this is the direction of the gradient. In this picture, I have also drawn two gray vectors, which actually take you from P, away from P, but two points on the same contour line. At least if you move a small distance along this or along this, you are still on the 100 meter contour line, which means that these are directions in which the height function does not increase at all. Note that these directions are actually perpendicular, at least they should have been, given my poor drawing skills, they are as close to perpendicular as I could make them, to the actual direction of steepest ascent. So this is going to be actually very useful in what we talk about next. The connection between the gradient vector and normals to equi phi surfaces or surfaces of constant value for the function phi. So what are we talking about here? We are essentially talking about a surface sigma which is defined by a condition that a function phi of x, y and z is a constant on that surface. So this is our equi phi surface. In physics we very often meet equipotential surfaces which are obviously such surfaces where the function phi is a potential. Let us consider point P on this surface sigma and think of all vectors dr which indicate displacements from the point P to neighboring points on the surface. Now, when we move along such vectors, the value of phi of course doesn't change. So the directional derivative 
of phi along those directions is 0 or the change in phi d phi for small displacements along such directions is definitely 0. But we know that d phi is the value of gradient of phi at p dotted with the displacement dr. So this must be 0. So you note that this fixed vector at the point p which is the value of gradient of phi at p happens to be perpendicular to all displacements along that equi-phi surface. And therefore, this vector is the one which we call normal to the surface at the point P. It's normal or perpendicular to all vectors at point P on the surface itself. Now, how do you define the unit normal vector? To the surface of constant phi at the point P. Simple. That phi at P gives you a value of the vector which is normal to the surface. To make it a unit vector you have to divide by its length. So this grad phi at P divided by magnitude of grad phi at P is the unit vector. Of course you could have minus this quantity as well because that would mean that instead of this particular unit vector, which is in the direction of grad phi, you are choosing the one which is in the opposite direction, which is also a normal to this surface. Now, of these two normals, the positive sign has a significance that it gives us the direction of increasing phi. So, this surface is for phi taking constant value, but as you move away from the surface along the normal, of course, phi increases the fastest or decreases the fastest if you are going the other way. If you are going in the direction of grad phi, the value of phi here rises as fast as it can. As far as we are concerned, the important thing is, the plus sign gives you the direction in which phi is increasing. The minus sign actually gives you the direction in which phi is decreasing. Now, we have been carrying around this notation grad phi for quite some time, but because we need to use this very often, and because, as will turn out, changing the notation has other wonderful side effects, we introduce a change in, in the notation here. For that, we take a look at gradient of phi again. Note that the Vector field gradient of phi is given by del phi del x i plus del phi del y j plus del phi del z k. The value of gradient of phi at a point p, of course, is given by the same expression, but there all of these partial derivatives are evaluated at the point p. So there, all of these partial derivatives were values, numbers. Here, these partial derivatives are functions. Which is why grad phi is a vector field and not a vector. Now, this notation that I have been talking about follows from the idea that this is like something which is acting on phi, the scalar, to produce this vector field grad phi. And that something is simply this operator i del del x plus j del del y plus k del del z. Now, because of the presence of the unit vectors i, j and k, this definitely looks like a vector. On the other hand, the components, so to speak, that it has are not numbers, but operators, partial derivatives. So this is a vector valued operator or operator valued vector, depending on what you are focusing on. And it pays off to give this operator a name. You call this the del operator or the nabla operator. and this operator is simply i del del x plus j del del phi plus k del del z. And our shorthand becomes, you just write the nabla operator. The arrow is something we are going to use because we can't write boldface on the screen with this pen. Some texts use a boldface nabla to indicate that it's a vector. Some just omit the arrow, assume that you will understand it's a vector or at least a vector-like operator from the notation itself.
When you apply this vector-like operator on a scalar, what you get is a vector field. So this is a way of converting a scalar field into a vector field. Our familiar gradient of phi. Now because this is a vector field, and this looks a bit like a multiplication, we can pretend that this is actually a vector field multiplying a scalar, giving a vector field. Although, frankly, that's a very dangerous association to make. Unless you understand things clearly, it's always best to think of this just as a shorthand for gradient of phi. But if you think of how this could act on vector fields, well, there are two obvious ways. One is it could act by taking a dot product. So I have a vector field A. I pretend that nabla is a genuine vector and take its dot product with A. I get del A x del x plus del A y del y plus del A z del z. Just like A dot B is A x B x plus A y B y plus A z B z. The only difference here is of course we are not multiplying the components of A by the components of nabla. We are applying the components of nabla which are partial derivatives on the components of A. And this gives us a new scalar field. A quantity which gives you a scalar at every point. This scalar field is called the divergence of A. The other member of the Holy Trinity that I referred to at the very beginning shortened to div A. There is yet another way of applying a vector operator on a vector field. You could take a cross product. And that will give you a new vector field with components given by things like del AZ del Y minus del AY del Z and so on. If you remember the formula for the cross product of two vectors, you should be able to figure out exactly why this takes the form that it does. For example, the x component of a cross b is actually a y b z minus a z b y. Here the role of a is being played by the components of nabla, so a y becomes del del y. b z actually is a z here. So del del y acting on a z minus a z b y becomes del del z of a y and so on. Now this new vector field which you get out of a is also very useful. It's another member of this holy trinity that I talked about. It's called the curl of A. Now, as far as today's lecture is concerned, this is just a matter of notation. There are the two new kinds of things you can get out of a vector field, the divergence and the curl. And I've just used the nabla operator to give you a convenient way of representing them. Now, before you get too comfortable with this idea of using nabla, as a vector, as we have done here and here, let me issue a word of warning. In vectors, a dot b is the same as b dot a, but del dot a is definitely not the same as a dot del. The order here matters. In fact, a dot del, if we were to just calculate the dot product treating A and nabla, the del operator, as vectors would turn out to be AX times del del X plus AY times del del Y plus AZ times del del Z. That's not a scalar field at all. In fact, it's an operator. It's waiting for something to be provided to it so that it can act on it and provide you with a new thing. Indeed, we call this a scalar operator because if you were to feed it a scalar field, you are going to end up with a scalar at the end of the calculation. If you were to feed it a vector field, on the other hand, just like multiplying a vector by a scalar gives you a vector, in this case, a dot del acting on a vector field will produce a vector field. Let me just show you this in some detail. A dot del acting on phi is simple. It's AX del del X plus AY del del Y plus AZ del del Z acting on phi. And it's simply the scalar field. AX del phi del X plus AY del phi del Y plus AZ del phi del Z. In fact, in this case, you can easily see that this is actually same as A 
dotted with gradient of phi. So it's as if the del operator has shifted from being in the dot product with A to acting upon the scalar field phi. What about a vector field? When A dot del acts on B, the vector field, it actually acts on this thing. A x del del x acts on B vector. You add to that A y del del y acting on the B vector and A z del del z acting on the B vector. And if you write B vector out in full, you get three such terms. These are simply A x del del x, A y del del y and A z del del z acting respectively on B x i plus B y j plus B z k and add it together. And if you collect the i, j, k components, x, y, z components of this entity, you are going to get a x del del x b x plus a y del del y b x plus a z del del y b x times i hat and a very similar thing for j hat and k hat. Therefore, this a dot del acting on b vector is the same as a dot del acting on bx, giving the x component or the i hat component, a dot del time acting on by gives you the j component, a dot del acting on bz gives you the k component. Once again, it should be very clear that a dot del is an entirely different entity from del dot a. And similarly, a cross del is again an operator. This time it's a vector value operator. These entities are very, very different from del dot A, which is a scalar field, and del cross A, which is a vector field, respectively the divergence and curl of A. Now we will come back to talk about divergence and curl, as well as these other combinations A dot del or A cross del later on, even the new ones that we met right now, a dot del and a cross del, are actually quite useful, although they may not have as much significance as the divergence and the curl. But for the time being, let us go back to the gradient. But this time we will take a look at how to calculate the gradient in other coordinate systems. Now the guiding principle for us in all coordinates is the following. If you take the dot product of the gradient of phi at a point with dr, the displacement from that point, you are going to get small d phi, which is the change in phi when this displacement occurs. Now, this is going to be valid no matter which coordinate system you are using. Now, in particular, when we talk about the spherical polar coordinate system, the displacement that occurs, of course, occurs because the coordinates r, theta and phi change. And here we are going to consider an infinitesimally small displacement. dr, d theta and d phi are going to change by infinitesimal values. Now this picture may not be very clear at this stage, but I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with this. This depicts the direction in which a point will move if you were to change r and r alone. And if you change r through dr, the distance the point will move is dr. And this Vector will be denoted by dr times a unit vector in which a point moves when r and only r changes. That is called r hat. So if you change only r, the displacement is going to be dr r hat. If you change theta, which is this angle, the point actually moves in this direction. Along a circle of radius r centered at the origin, so the displacement that you get points this way. How much does the point move? If the theta angle changes through d theta, the distance which the point moves, at least for infinitesimal d theta, is simply nothing but the length of this arc of a circle of radius r, and that's r d theta. So it moves to a distance r d theta in the direction given by increasing theta, and that's called theta hat. So that is the displacement a point is going to suffer if you change theta and theta alone through an infinitesimal amount d theta. On the other hand, if phi were to change, 
the point would move in a circle of radius r sin theta, this radius centered at a point on the z axis. And here, if the angle changes to d phi, again another infinitesimal quantity, then the displacement will be of a magnitude r sin theta, the radius of the circle, into the angle d phi. And of course, it will be in this direction. The tangent direction to this circle, which is perpendicular to both the directions of r hat and theta hat, and this direction is what we call phi hat. So the displacement for changing phi alone would be r sin theta d phi phi hat. What happens if we were to change all three? It should take a moment's thought to figure out that then the infinitesimal displacement will be the sum of these three vectors. This tiny thing here will be a rectangular parallel paper. Well, for large changes it would not have been rectangular, but for tiny changes this would be a rectangular parallel paper. And the sum of the three vectors would be along the diagonal to this parallel paper, which will be the actual displacement when r changes to r plus dr, theta changes to theta plus d theta, and phi changes to phi plus d phi. So this is the expression for the displacement vector in spherical polar coordinates. Now, one problem that we will encounter here, of course, is that we can no longer call our scalar function phi because we are using phi for the coordinate, at least one of the coordinates. So we are going to switch to capital F. The change in F, which is a function of r, theta, and phi, will simply be exactly what we have been seeing so far. Partial derivatives with respect to the coordinates multiplied by the changes in the coordinates, infinitesimal ones, and added up over all coordinates. Del F del r dr plus del F del theta d theta plus del F del phi d phi. Now I want to rewrite this as a dot product with the displacement dr, which is in green here. And the vector that you have to carry out the dot product with in order to get this is here. It has the components del f del r, del f del theta, del f del phi in the r hat, theta hat, phi hat direction. Just like we had del phi del x, del phi del y and del phi del z when we were talking about grad phi. But here we have this additional 1 by r factor here and a 1 by r sine theta factor here. Why do you need them? You need them exactly to cancel out the r and the r sine theta respectively in these two displacement terms so that when I take the dot product I actually get this expression back. So this tells us that in spherical polar coordinate system gradient of a function f is given by del f del r r hat plus 1 by r del f del theta theta hat plus 1 by r sin theta del f del phi phi hat. Now that we are on the topic of spherical polar coordinates, let us look back a bit and try to figure out how we could find r hat theta hat phi hat, these unit vectors, in terms of our more familiar ij case. And for that we are going to use the idea that these are vectors in the direction of increasing r, theta and phi respectively, which means they are actually normal to surfaces of constant r, constant theta and constant phi. For example, r hat is a unit normal to the surface r equal to constant. In fact, it is the unit normal in the direction of the gradient of this r equal to constant function. In terms of Cartesian coordinates, the function we are talking about, this r, is square root of x square plus y square plus z square. So what about the gradient of this f? We are back to Cartesian coordinates. So we are going to use del f del x, del f del y and del f del z as components of the gradient. To calculate these, it's really simple. After all, this is a square root and that gives you a square root with a 2 in the denominator and of course because you are differentiating x square plus y square plus z square, but you should be differentiating with respect to x, you have a 2x factor. This is for the x derivative. The y and the z derivative can be figured out equally easily. So collecting them all together, what you get for grad f is xi plus yj plus zk 
divided by the square root of x square plus y square plus z square. Now usually when you calculate the gradient and you want to find out the unit normal in the direction of the gradient, you would have to normalize. Here you do not have to because it's clear from the form that this is already a unit vector. In fact, this is the unit vector r vector in the numerator divided by the length of the r vector in the denominator, which of course is what we call the unit radial vector r hat. So at least here we can clearly identify that the gradient that we have got as a result of our calculation is the vector in the direction of increasing r. Now, here I have written this in a slightly hybrid kind of relation. I have used the theta and phi angles to rewrite this. The r of course cancels between the numerator and the denominator. And this is the form which r hat takes as a function of the angles describing a point. Note that r hat as well as theta hat and phi hat are unit vectors but they are not constant vectors. They actually change from point to point as you can see from the components which are functions of theta and phi here. Now what about the other unit vectors theta hat and phi hat? If you remember your spherical polar coordinates properly, you would realize that tangent of the angle theta in terms of Cartesian coordinates is nothing but square root of x square plus y square divided by z just to show you that more a bit more clearly let's look good, go back to this diagram here z would be just this component on the other hand this component the one perpendicular to this has a length which is square root of r square minus z square this being the third side of a right angle triangle and that's of course square root of x square plus y square so square root of x square plus y square is this length this is z so tangent of theta is given by square root of x square plus y square over z as we have stated so what we need to do is treat this tan inverse square root of x square plus y square by z as a function which defines the surface of constant theta and we move away from that in the direction of increasing theta we should get theta hat. However, what makes life a bit easier for us is that theta hat is not only the unit normal to the surface given by square root of x square plus y square by z equals constant or values of that equals constant which is even more complicated but it can also be described a bit more simply as the unit normal to the same surface but now described through x square plus y square by z square equals constant. That you will agree is definitely simpler, at least a simpler function to differentiate and handle than tan inverse of square root of x square plus y square by z. Now how do you get the gradient of this? Simple. If you call this function f x square plus y square by z square, you are going to get 2x over z square that's for the x component that's absolute trivial similarly 2y by z square as well as the third the z component is also pretty simple minus 2 x square plus y square by z cube now if you take 2 by z cube common out you are going to get xz plus i plus yz j minus x square plus y square k note that ultimately i'm going to look for the unit vector so it's the direction which really matters an overall factor of 2 by z cube would cancel anyway when we get to divide by the norm of graph f. So we can just forget about 2 by z cube. In fact, also about an r square factor which each of these terms have and say grad f is proportional to sin theta cos theta cos phi coming from x times z. Remember, x is r sin theta cos phi and z is r cos theta. I've dropped the r square because it's again a common factor in all three terms. Plus yz gives you sin theta sin phi times cosine theta and x square plus y square of course is sin square theta. So this is not grad f. This is actually grad f if you were to divide by 2 r square by z cube. But this is the vector whose length we are going to find and divide by to get the unit vector that we want. 
This extra factor of 2 r square by z cube, as I said, would cancel in this calculation anyway, when you were trying to find the normal, unit normal vector. So what is the norm of this vector, or length squared of the vector as it stands? Is sine square theta cosine square phi cosine square theta plus sine square theta cosine square theta sine square phi, which together give you sine square theta cosine square theta. And this of course gives you sine of 4 theta. And if you take sine square theta common from these two terms, you get to see that by this miracle of sine square theta plus cos square theta being equal to 1, we end up with the norm square of the length being sine square theta. The length here is sine theta. Note that we want the vector in the direction of increasing theta, so we should divide by the actual length of the vector, not negative of that length. Some of you might think that you would need to do mod of sine theta to get the actual positive square root instead of just taking the square root of sine square theta as sine theta. But let me point out that for the angles of interest where theta runs between 0 to pi, which is its range in spherical polar coordinates, sine theta is actually positive throughout. So mod sine theta and sine theta are the same thing. That is what we are going to divide this expression by in order to get the unit vector in the direction of increasing theta, namely theta hat. So theta hat works out to be again in a hybrid kind of mixed Cartesian and spherical polar notation. Cartesian vector, but components expressed in terms of the angles as this thing. The sine theta cancels from the first two terms and you have to divide this term by sine theta to get minus sine theta k hat. So this is our expression for theta hat. If you were to compare this with r hat, you would see that both are unit vectors. And you can directly check very, very simply that they are perpendicular to each other. That is, the dot product is zero. Well, we have one more left, phi hat. Let me leave that as an exercise for you. In fact, it's actually even simpler to calculate than theta hat. And I want also that you should check that the dot products r hat dot theta hat, theta hat dot phi hat, phi hat dot r hat are all zero. So these give us a set of three unit vectors perpendicular to each other at the point P given by the spherical polar coordinates r theta and phi. And as we have seen over and over again, these vectors change when you change your point. In particular, they change when you change theta and phi. If you move radially outwards, that is only change r and not change theta and phi, actually the new r hat theta hat phi hat vectors would just be translated versions of the old r hat theta hat phi hat vectors. But if you were to move in any other way, the vectors would change direction as well. Another very important coordinate system that is often used is cylindrical polar coordinate system. I will quickly just go through this. The idea here, as you can see from a top view, this is from the direction of positive z-axis. If we are to change s, which I am calling the radial coordinate, you are going to move away from the z-axis to a distance ds in a direction which is given by the unit vector s hat. This is a radial direction, but radial from the axis, not radial from an origin. So this is a vector which points directly away from the axis. So ds s hat is the displacement you suffer when you change s and s alone. If you have to change the angle theta and theta alone, the particle or the point would move in a circle of radius s around the z-axis. And because the angular change is d theta, the displacement will be s times d theta, radius times angular displacement, in the direction perpendicular to s hat. Perpendicular simply because it's along the tangent to, to the circle and s hat is along the radius. And Finally, there is another component of displacement which I have not shown in this figure. That's very simple. If you change z and only z, you're going to move parallel to the z-axis, so along a unit vector called z hat, through a distance dz. And if all three, s, theta, and z, were to change by infinitesimal amounts, the displacement dr vector will be ds s hat plus s d theta theta hat plus dz z hat. And it's obvious now that the gradient of a function f of s theta z can be written down almost directly by looking at this. You are going to get del f del s 
for the SH component. The theta hat component will have an extra 1 by S factor to cancel out this S factor. And the Z component will be del F del Z. It's obvious that del rad F dot dr will give you del F del S ds plus del F del theta d theta plus del F del Z dz, which is exactly what you want. Now, there can be more general orthogonal coordinate systems that we often use, where the coordinates q1, q2, q3 are chosen in such a way that the directions of increasing q1, increasing q2, and increasing q3, the vectors e1, e2, e3 in this formula, are perpendicular at all points. That's why you call this a general orthogonal coordinate system. There the displacement will be proportional to dq1, dq2, dq3, but with factors h1, h2, h3, which could depend very well on all three of the coordinates. You should realize that our spherical polar and cylindrical polar coordinate systems have been special examples of those simple functions h1, h2, h3. Indeed, even our Cartesian coordinate system is a special example of this one, where h1, h2, and h3 are all equal to 1. In spherical polar or cylindrical polar, at least one or more of these factors is not identically equal to 1. But this is your expression for displacement in any such general orthogonal coordinate system. In such a general orthogonal coordinate system, the gradient of a scalar field phi will be given by partial derivatives del del q1, del del q2, and del del q3 acting on phi to give you the three components. But you would have to incorporate extra factors of 1 over h1, 1 over h2, and 1 over h3. So that when you take the dot product of grad phi and dr, you do get del phi del q1 dq1 plus del phi del q2 dq2 plus del phi del q3 dq3, which of course is a differential of phi. So in today's lecture, we met the gradient 1, as I mentioned, of the holy trinity, rad, div, and curl. In the next lectures, we are going to take a look at the divergence and the curl their expressions, how to calculate them, how to use them, and also, perhaps much more importantly, what do they really mean? In this lecture, we have met the divergence and the curl very briefly, but that was more like a formal mathematical thing where we had this Nabla operator, and we dotted it with a vector field to get divergence, crossed it with a vector field to get curl. But there is much more to divergence and curl than just del dot or del cross and I hope to explain those things to you in the coming lectures. Bye for today.